You're listening to part two of my incredible conversation with music legend Rodney Jerkins, who has worked with some of the greatest and most successful artists of all time, including Michael Jackson, Rihanna, Beyonce, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande, and many more, and whose albums have sold more than 2 billion copies and whose songs have been streamed more than 50 billion times. So you had a great mentor and internship in Teddy Riley. And he said to you in one of your sessions that he wants you to meet Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson was the guy you were listening to in a mall in Canton, Ohio, that lit you on fire. And here you are, less than 10 years later, and you've got a king in the music business telling you, you want to, he wants you to meet Michael Jackson. Then you get a call to come over to Carol Bayer Sager, who was married to Bob Daly, I think at the time, the chairman of Warner Brothers. And to come on over, um, Michael's here and he wants to meet you. Walk us through what on earth you're thinking when someone says, I want to introduce you to Michael Jackson. And what are you thinking when you meet him and you're pulling up to Carol's house, knowing he's there to meet you and possibly work with you? The biggest superstar in the world perhaps ever at that point in time okay so it starts like this teddy riley says i'm going to take you to meet michael jackson someday he said that to to to, to myself and my father i want to take you to be michael jackson someday and i of course you don't when you're in it you don't really believe that's real right you don't you just okay this guy is saying that because I'm, you know, here and I'm working with him and he knows I love Michael just as much as he does. But then reality kicks in. And all I know is one day Teddy says, everybody pack up. We have to go to New York. And it was three Quest vans outside the studio. I didn't know what was going on, to be completely honest. We never went anywhere before. And all I know is Teddy said, I want you to be in a van with me. So I was in the van with him and his driver and then his brothers and other people were in other vans and we're going to New York and the whole time from Virginia Beach to New York, all Teddy played was Michael Jackson. I'm in the back seat and I'm starting to think, oh, wow, we're going to New York because of Michael Jackson because I had been around Teddy so much as an intern. And I knew that whenever he was going to work on a project, he studied the person's music right before it was time to work with them. And so he was listening really in with intense ears the whole way in the middle of the night going to, going to New York. When we got to New York, we checked into the hotel. I went to my room. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. And next thing you know, the phone rings in the room. And Teddy says, calls me little bro. Little bro, come down to the lobby. So I'm like, man, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. Come down to the lobby. And he goes, we got to go to the studio. And we go down the street to the hit factory. And next thing you know, we walked into the studio and there was Michael Jackson. And Teddy introduced me to Michael Jackson and said, you're going to work with this kid someday. And Michael kind of giggled like, you know, his little soft laugh. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to work with you someday, Michael. I'm going to work with you someday. And I was in awe. It was like, it was just a crazy moment. And that was it. And that was it. I went back to the hotel and we stayed in New York for like two weeks. And Teddy was working with Michael. And I was in another room working on other projects for Teddy. And that was it. Saw Michael one time and that was it. Fast forward a few years later. I'm at my parents' home, the home that I bought them. I fell asleep on my mother's couch. And I had this dream that I was pulling up to a studio and it was all glass. And in the glass was this guy with the red shirt on and a derby hat. And it was Michael Jackson. I woke up and I told my mother and father this dream. I said, I just had this dream that Michael Jackson was in the, the glad, in the window of this studio and I was pulling up to work with him. And it was so vivid and so real. 
Not much after that, not much longer, the phone rings and this lady, Carol Bear Sager, is on the phone. And she's calling me because at that time I had the biggest song out. It was Say My Name by Destiny's Child. And she says, is this Rodney Jerkins? I said, yeah. I didn't even know who she was, to be completely honest. Like, I heard her name, but I didn't know the song she wrote with Burke Bacharach and Reach Out and Touch Someone's Hand, you know, you know, all these great songs, classic songs. And we started talking and she says, I want you to come to my house and work with me and Michael Jackson. And I'm like, hur, hur. I'm choked up. I'm like, what? I just had this dream. <laughs> this is, this can't be real, but it is real. And I said, when, when? And she goes, I don't know yet, but um, once I talk to Michael, I'll let you know. And Randall, I jumped on a plane immediately. I checked myself into a hotel and I just stayed in a hotel patiently waiting for her to call me and let me know when we were going to work. And a few days later, she called me and she goes, do you think you can work, come out here, fly out here tomorrow? And I said, I'm already here. I'm ar-, she said, I said, I'm already here. And she said, okay, well, tomorrow we're going to have a session at, come to my house at noon. And so she gave me her address. And as I'm going up her driveway, she has this guest house to the left, which is a studio. And through the glass, I see a red shirt. Just like the dream I had four days before that. It was Michael Jackson. And I went in her house and I met Michael again. Told him that I had the same guy that met him with Teddy Riley. I started playing the piano for him and we started creating from that day. That was in February of 1999. You have a lot of stories about Michael and I want to focus on just yes. a couple of them. And I want to talk about, let's start with the importance of work ethic in our career and the importance of it to our success. Can you tell us about what kind of stuff he was doing in the studio and the outfit changes he would make and getting called to his hotel room in the middle of the night to start rehearsing with him. And there was a whole team of people there at three in the morning. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole process of working with Michael was much different from any other artist that I worked with much way different. Um, the intent, the intensity of the, of working with him was on a, just to a different level. His, the, he's a, he's a perfectionist. Um, he gets lost and exhausted in the music and the rhythms. Uh, you know, there would be, he would, he would literally have to, I would have to order, I would have to order several Hanes t-shirts for every session because he would dance so intensely in the booth that he would sweat out the shirt, literally sweat out the shirt. And I would have to have other shirts ready for him. So he would literally change into another shirt, keep recording, sweat out that shirt. That's how intense his ethic, his work ethic was. You know, not just him being at the hotel three and o'clock in the morning for rehearsals, but him calling me at four o'clock in the morning, asking to hear what I worked on during the day. I mean, it was like nonstop, three, four o'clock in the morning, play what you worked on today. And I'm like, really, Michael? Really? Can you really hear this over, over the phone? He said, play it. And I'm playing it over the phone and he would tell me to turn the hi-hat down two dBs, turn the snare up one dB. Over the phone, he's telling me this. It blew my mind. I never, and he was always right. That was the other part about working with him. He was always right. Like, it wasn't like he was just saying it. He actually really felt like the hi-hat should come down two dBs and the snare should come up. And it was always right. He was like right on point. It was just a magical experience for me, like to work with him, um, in those years, we worked together for a good two and a half to three years straight. And um, it was beautiful. Like I spent a lot of time with him and flew, flew with him and worked in several studios, got a chance to hang out at Neverland and hang out with his family. And just, just, a, just a great, just one of the greatest, greatest moments of my life. Greatest, greatest memories I've ever made in my life was working with Michael for sure. Sure. You guys were extremely close. Can you share with us a Michael Jackson story that nobody else has ever heard or knows about? Yeah, I think I don't, I don't know if people have. I don't know if people have heard this story, but I, 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 I saved his life once, and I was just telling my son this story the other day. 
because um, we were at Neverland and Michael, um, he said he wanted to go out four wheeling one day. So me, my, my brother, one of my writers, LaShawn Daniels and Michael, we all got on four wheelers and we started riding these four wheelers. And Neverland, I don't know if you know, but Neverland is up in the mountains and it's miles and miles of property. And we're riding and it's starting to get late and we're way up in the mountains. And I said to Michael, I said, I think we should turn around. Michael really didn't keep track of time. And I said, I think we should turn around. Like I could tell it's getting late and we're far away. I don't don't even know where we are, to be honest, this trail. And so as we went to go turn around, Michael's wheel on his four-wheeler caught a rock, like a rock. And literally, in one second, his four-wheeler was leaning over this cliff. And I got, I got off of my, my four-wheeler and I grabbed him. And my brother grabbed the, the four, his four-wheeler. And we we're all looking down and all we saw was a cliff down. And Michael said, oh, Rod, you, sa- you saved my life. You saved my life. It re- it's true. If, if he would have just moved one inch, him, he literally would have been off over that, whole, that, that, that cliff. He literally would have been over that cliff. And so that was a, a craziest, one of the craziest moments that I've ever experienced. But also, it built some type of bond <laughs> between him and I. Because after that, I felt like our relationship with to a completely different level. The trust factor and just the, the loyalty factor um, of our relationship went to a, and just an incredible level after that moment. How difficult was it for you to watch Michael be accused of molesting young children? And what, if you're comfortable sharing, what kind of conversations were you having during that period of time? It was super um, uncomfortable because um, I was around him so much and I was, and I was actually around him with his children, around, around him at the time when there was um, people that he knew, other, other, um, other families that had children that would go to Neverland just to watch movies and, um, or kids that were sick that had illnesses that he built. He built a certain type of room in his theater just for those types of children that couldn't actually be around other kids like almost like a hospital room, but in the theater to watch their favorite movie. So I was around him and I saw the heart that he had for people and how giving he was and would have conversations, you know, when, when things would pop up on the news, I would actually see him cry. And he would actually say, look how, look how, look at the monster they're trying to portray me as. Look who they want me to become. That's not who I am. And they, and they know it and I know it. And, um, and I would sit back and I knew it too. And I would be like, wow, this is crazy. Like the picture they were trying to paint to everyone. And I was there the whole time with them and learning so much from this guy and seeing the kind of person he was. Guy would literally give, literally would give the shoes and shirt off, give the shirt off his back, shoes off his feet to anybody. I mean, the most giving, probably the giving person, most giving person I've ever met. Um, never wanted to hurt anybody, never wanted to hurt a child ever, um, was just a kind person that really cared about humanity as a whole. And in a time where people wrote songs about dancing and people wrote songs about um, love, if you really look, Michael was writing songs about humanity. He was writing songs like Man in the Mirror, Look at Yourself. He was writing songs about heal the world. He's writing songs like Earth Song. He was writing songs like um, The Lost Children, writing songs called Speechless, writing songs called um, um, We Are the World. Like this guy was writing songs that no one else was writing. He was writing songs about humanity because I really believe he sincerely wanted the earth to be a better place. And he believed that, you know, it started with, you know, children and, and, um, and us being, you know, having the heart, the heart of children, the innocent heart of children. So uh, it hurt me when uh, he was going through all of those allegations. Um, in fact, in 2003, uh, Michael called 
myself and my father and asked where we were. And we just so happened to be in a studio in Los Angeles. And Chris Tucker, who's a good friend of mine, just happened to be there. And Michael said that he wanted prayer because he was on trial. And he drove all the way from Neverland, all the way down to Los Angeles, which was like a two hour plus drive just to, just for us to pray for him. And, you know, and my dad and I and Chris Tucker, we prayed for him and we just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give him the strength and give him peace through those whatever, you know, he was going through at that time. It was wearing, it was wearing him out, wearing him down. But, you know, we believe that God would give him strength and and um, so, yeah, I, I felt very uncomfortable, but I always knew in my heart of hearts that he was, you know, innocent. And and I, I stand by that statement. And, you know, I believe that. The first concert I went to, I was five years old and it was the Jackson Five. And Michael Jackson, I believe at the time, was five years old. Um, and that was the first show I ever saw in my life. It was great at the Pine Knob Music Theater in Detroit. I don't know if you've been there or not, but um, it was it was a great show. I still remember it. You always remember your first concert. It was my first stadium. It was an outdoor amphitheater, and I thought, gosh, look at that whole band, but that little kid's amazing. He's my age. Look at what he's doing. We've talked about Michael's work ethic, and I don't think a lot of people would know that at three in the morning, he's got his whole dance team in his hotel suite working out uh, songs and choreographing at three in the morning. One thing that has led to some of my success is something I call the extreme preparation is preparing more than everybody else in the room, being the most prepared person in the room, where if someone spends five hours for something, I may spend 40 hours for something. Can you tell us some examples of extreme preparation in your career and how out preparing everybody else and maybe give some specifics on that. And then I also want to talk about your thoughts on Beyonce and Lady Gaga. Randall, we're just alike. I'm 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 a I am just like you in that regards of extreme preparation. Um I've been doing it since the, as a teenager all the way to now. I take I take every project serious the same as if, you know, whether it's Michael Jackson or a new artist. I prepare like you would not believe. Um, in fact, I tell my son who plays golf, I say, never get ready, be ready. Um, we don't have time to get ready anymore. You got to be ready. You never know when that when that call is going to happen. Um, when I was working with Michael, I think that's why he liked working with me so much because I was beyond prepared for him. Um, when I got that call officially after I met him at Carol Bears and he said, I want you to come work with me in LA. He said, what do you need? And I told him, um, and my and my wife even we joke about this to this day. I will spend days, months just on sound design alone, just on sound design, preparing for whatever you know, whatever I think the next quarter or the next year looks like in my eyes of music. I will spend so much time and all my all my um, proteges notice about me. I will spend just just getting the right sounds together for projects. Um, I believe I believe in being overly prepared for whatever you're going to work for, whatever artist you're going to work for, um, because to me it's it's the way. My job is to whoever I work with. I, my job is to take them to their next level. If they're already at a huge level, they, they need to go further. If they're new artists, we need to get them out and become stars or superstars. So in order for that to happen, first, I need to study. I need to study and I need to know who it is that I'm creating for. I want to know everything about them, um, not just their singing ability or their performance ability, but I want to know everything about them, their life and what's going on in their life. And then I want to, and then I want to be able to prepare for when that time comes, and be ready to just walk in and deliver what I know is the best version of me for them. So I agree. With, I'm with you 200. percent I'm always overly prepared 
for for whatever it is, whatever present, presentation that I have to make. In fact, I'm sometimes too prepared because you know I you know I played sixty tracks for Michael when I met with him. He said no one has ever walked in a room and played that many tracks for me. I was beyond prepared for, for to work with Michael. I don't think there's any such thing as being too prepared. The fact that Michael Jackson, who could work with anybody he wants to and did work with whoever he wanted to, told you that you're the most prepared person and prepared more songs than anybody is a statement within a statement. And I think I, I do a lot of coaching and mentoring, Rodney. And I tell people all the time, be the most prepared person ever to walk in that room, show people that you're prepared and whether you achieve a successful outcome at that specific moment or not, the probability you do is going to be substantially higher if you do. But that person, it may not happen that exact moment. That person is going to remember you for the rest of their life. And you're going to get another at bat at some point, either because they're going to proactively reach out to you or you're going to come back and have another bite of that apple. And I've been coaching this and preaching this, and it usually falls on deaf ears, but it has a 100% success rate long term. You can easily be the most prepared person that someone has ever met. That's right. You could have stopped at thirty songs, right? That's you right. could have stopped at forty. What that's What does right. the average person do? And in, in that situation, you're going to meet with someone who's great. It could be Michael or Rihanna or someone who's not, frankly. Um, but how many songs are people preparing when they go in for a meeting like that on average? Five, 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 five. to seven, easily. Yeah, five to seven easily. If they got 10, then maybe 10. Yeah, that's the average. Right. right. Yeah. So you're seven to 10x. And and it's, it's was the investment. So how many extra, how, how much extra time was that in terms of um, hours? Is that another 100 hours, 200 hours of work? For me? For, for, yeah, when, for what? When you prepared 60 songs, how, how long did that take you? Yeah, uh, probably a, a couple hundred hours. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to guess that was one of the best investments you ever made in your life, a uh, return on investment. Of course. I mean, we, we're talking about Michael Jackson. You're talking about me, you're talking about me working with Michael Jackson. So, yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, talk about Beyonce and her work ethic and Lady Gaga. I think you said one's a little higher than the other. And then you've also said Beyonce is one of the most beautiful people you've ever met in your life. I'm sure people would love to know more about Beyonce. I think Beyonce was probably the closest, closest, um, closest person with the same type of drive to Michael Jackson that I work with. Very similar in perfection and reaching and striving for perfection. Um, and knowing exactly what she wanted, uh, very in control of what her performance and everything must look like. I remember working with her on the song called Deja Vu that I did with her and Jay-Z. Um, and I remember her talking to the directors and they were coming to the studio and her explaining her vision and to these people and what kind of clothes she wanted to wear and everything. Like she just was really hands-on about how it, how it had to look, how the visuals had to be. Um, I just think that, you know, um, every once in a generation, an artist comes around that has a different type of passion to want to be so much greater than even the artist that they looked up to, right? It's not just about making it anymore. It's not just about getting a record deal, but it's actually achieving something so much greater. So it's if it's if it's if it's Michael Jackson saying I looked up to James Brown, then I need to be better than James Brown. Right? If it's Beyonce saying I looked up to uh uh Aretha Franklin, I don't know, whoever her person was, I need to be better than that. And I need to reach these goals. So I saw a lot of similarities between Beyonce and Michael. Saw a lot, a lot of similarities. And it was just amazing. She was amazing. She's an amazing artist to, to work with. Just amazing, like, because 
the one thing you know when you work with someone like a Michael Jackson or, or, or Beyonce, you know that they would deliver the performance of the song, right? You're not just doing a song and the performance is going to fall flat. You can almost bet the house on it that the performance, if they perform it live or in the Grammys or visual or whatever, it was going to be incredible. It was going to be a movie. A video wouldn't just be a normal video. It would be like a movie. The performance would be like, whoa, mind-boggling performance. You just know that. You just know that with those, with those type of artists. What does Beyonce do different than someone else does? What's the difference? It's, it's preparation. It goes back to what you said. You know, I, I had a chance to talk to Kobe Bryant before he passed away. And Kobe Bryant told me a story about um, Michael Jackson. And he's told me a story about when he, when he first came into the league as a rookie and everybody was saying he had the Michael Jordan type tendencies. He said Michael Jackson called him and he asked him, do, do you want to be the best? And Kobe said, yeah, I want to be the best. He goes, what time do you go to gym to practice every morning? He said, I usually get there like 6.30 and I stay there till like 8.30. And Michael said, you should be getting there right now at 3.30 and staying until 9.30. He said, you can't be best just practicing two hours. You need to practice. You need to be the first one to get there and the last one to leave. You need to be overly prepared for, for battle. And Kobe said when he, when he heard that from Michael, he, he got to the gym at 3 the next morning. And he stayed to 9 o'clock. And he said that, you know, he was, he was prepared. Michael told him to do the one move that he wanted to master for six hours straight. Don't worry about doing a bunch of different moves. He said, I practiced the moonwalk for six hours straight until I mastered it. Whatever shot you want to shoot that you want to take, master it. Beyonce was the same way, same exact way. Rehearsals, you know, the first one, there, the last to leave type of ad the attitude, the same mentality. I call it the killer instinct, right? The ability to just, um, outwork anybody when you when you when you're ready and you're willing to outwork anyone on your your own team, on your own team, not just the competitors, but the ones on your own team, right? If you're outworking them, then you know, you know, even with the success, she was still outworking everybody. She was still spending hours and hours and hours and hours in the studio, and hours and hours and hours and hours at the rehearsal studio. I mean. She was preparing for who she is now ever since she was a little girl. Her father had her pre preparing as a young girl for these moments that we are now seeing now. This episode of In Search of Excellence is brought to you by Sandy.com. S-A-N-D-E-E.com. We are a Yelp for beaches and have created the world's most comprehensive beach resource by cataloging more than 100 categories of information for every beach in the world, more than 100,000 beaches in 212 countries. Sandy.com provides beachgoers around the world with detailed, comprehensive, and easy-to-use information to help them plan their perfect beach getaway at home and abroad, and to make sure you're never disappointed by a beach visit again. Plan the perfect beach trip today by visiting Sandy.com. That's www.sandee.com. The link is in our show notes. Stay Sandy, my friends. Are you looking for your next great gift to surprise a friend, colleague, or loved one? Bliss Beaches makes the perfect gift. This best-selling bright and beautiful coffee table book by Randall Kaplan features stunning drone photography from exotic beach locations around the world. It's the perfect housewarming gift, a great addition to any home or office, and a fun and creative alternative to bringing a bottle of wine to somebody's house for dinner. Bliss Beaches is available for purchase on Amazon, where it has glowing reviews and a five-star rating. Get your next amazing gift and order a copy of Bliss Beaches by clicking the link in our show notes. You mentioned something called first in, last out. I've been calling this Philo for the last 20 years, and it is a very simple concept that if anybody does it, it's going to lead to great success in their career. You're the first person in, you're the last person to leave, and you're putting in the hours. Um, great things are going to happen to you. I think your your career is so fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting back, I love music, and I thought, God, I'd love to hang out with Michael. I'd love to hang out with Beyonce and Lady Gaga. I'd love to meet them someday. I'd love to just go have a beer with them or have 
dinner with them. I mean, for you, it's no problem, right? There, Whitney Houston was Whitney Houston was coming to church with you and your family, and you're hanging out with all these cool people. But I want I I love Lady Gaga. What's Lady Gaga really like? She's awesome. She really, she really, Lady Gaga. <laughs> I still think about Lady Gaga all the time because she gave my son when my son was born. She came to my home and bought a teddy bear for him. So I always think about that moment. And you know, pre pre Lady Gaga, pre being you know this 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 um, this big artist to the world. She was just in the studio. We were writing for other people. Actually, Jimmy Iovine um, wanted us to write for the Pussycat Dolls and different artists. So her and I was just working and it was just something special about Gaga. We'll be in there. And I remember telling Jimmy, I'm like, Jimmy, I know we're working on these other artists, but Gaga is special. She just was so special. And um, and I used to tell her all the time, I say, Gaga, you're gonna be a superstar. And she says, I know, I know, I know. I, I will have nothing less for myself. I will have nothing <laughs> less for myself. She really believed that she was gonna be like the biggest pop star in the world. She really believed it. Like always was, she would literally say it all the time. And, um, and I got to tell you, it was just an honor and privilege to work with, with her because I got to know her as a person as well. And she was really a, a, a sweet, a really a sweet person, really sweet. You have amazing relationships. Your reputation in the music business is you're one of the nicest guys in the business. You're also known to be a man of faith. And you're working in an industry sometimes where there's a lot of conflict. Sometimes there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of bad words. Uh, a, a lot of your friends are putting some bad words in songs that I don't listen to. And I know they're the number one or top, top 10, top most popular songs on the planet. How do you deal with that conflict? And then can you, between your faith and some of the bad things that happen and some of these just terrible lyrics. And like you talk to, you're also known as someone to give advice to people going through hard times. You advise Chris yeah. Brown when he was dealing with assault issues with Rihanna. And you talk to Justin Bieber as well when he was going through some things as a young kid and doing some immature shit. So talk, talk to us about both those things. Well, one, you know, I'm proud of of all my songs. I'm proud that you can type Rodney Jerkins up in Spotify or Apple Music and, um, you know, however many songs that pop up, you won't find too many songs with derogatory language or or just, you know, songs that that don't reflect who I am morality-wise. I'm, I'm proud of that, number one. Um, I hate some of the music that's out here today and what it's being, what it's saying and what it's teaching our youth. I hate it with a passion and I will do everything in my power to combat it with the music that I make in the future. Um, number three, um, you know, people are humans, right? And I was taught that you can't be forgiven unless you know how to forgive. And I, um, and when I think about, you know, some of the pressure that a lot of these artists, you know, you want to be an artist, you want to make it big. But when you, as soon as you make it big, now you've got the, 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 the spotlight is on you, right? And, and everything that you do, you're, everybody's watching everything you do. And I just think a lot of artists, Chris Brown, Justin Bieber, Britney Spears, so many artists that I work with that have went through some, some horrible, troubling times, um, where they've been hurt or they've hurt or they've hurt others. Um, but they're human. They are. And I've always wanted to take the the big brother role and speak life into people, not speak death into people, but speak life and help people to understand, you know, that, you know, we all go through things, but there is, you know, there is a a, a bright light at the end of the tunnel with with, with with God's help. So I've always just, you know, I've, I've made myself available in our industry. I've made myself available to be there for people. And I think, you know, I've built a reputation where uh, managers and A&Rs, different people call me when they need, uh, when they need their artists to, to, when they need someone to talk to, they'll reach out to me and ask me, can I, can I, 
make a trip. I went on tour with Bieber just to just to kind of help life coach him. Um, and I just made myself, you know, I flew down to Orlando when the Chris Brown thing happened and spent time with him. I just stopped what I'm doing and stopped producing for a second because what is producing if you're not producing good life, you know, and, and pouring, um, uh, pouring great fertilizer on, on seeds, right? Because that's what they are. These, these artists sometimes are just young seeds that need to grow. And, you know, they don't have, they, they haven't been there long enough to have the wisdom. So they make, they make childish mistakes because they're still young and they're still learning. So, you know, I'm happy to be in a position I'm in that I can be trusted to, to, to help people out. So now you're a legend in the music business. I know you may not think of yourself that way, but you are. Collectively, the records you produced have sold over a billion copies. I'm not even sure what the number is. Uh, do you happen to know what the number is? I don't know. I just know I got like this, there's this, this app and they tell you how many streams you're at on it. And I thought it was off. They told me I was over 25 billion streams now. And I was like, that's not, that's, I'm, I gotta be close to, I gotta be close to 50. Like I didn't want to, I didn't believe it. I, I told them they gotta go, I told them to go check the data again. And you know, I, I think we're well past that number. 50 billion streams of songs that you have at least, produced. At, that's a, at, at least, at least. At least, okay. <clears throat> at least. So, 10 years old, you hear Michael Jackson. Now you're a legend in the music business. Every, you've worked with everyone and everyone wants to work with you. What are you going to do to the kid who tracks you down and gives you, there aren't cassette tapes anymore, but gives you a USB stick with his music on it? Are, are you going to let that kid stop you? Is your uh, uh, security guy going to let that kid through? 100%. Are you going to listen to that music? Yeah, I always listen. That's the beautiful thing about like how I find talent I nurture talent. You know, it's not always about yourself. It's about paying it forward. You know, there's, there's so many producers that you may not know of that are, that are like blown up right now that are produced for Bruno Mars, that are produced for Ariana Grande. And they all come from under my tutelage, the same way I came from under Teddy Riley's tutelage. So I always believe in paying it forward. Um, I always listen to the content that's sent to me, that's sent, that is sent my way. Um, cause you just never know where that dime, that next diamond is, right? You never know. Um, so, and I like to stay connected to talent and young talent. So yeah, I'm always looking and I'm always listening. So let's go back. You're a little, you're, you're in a talent show at school and your dad's not letting you listen to any rap music and you dress up as big daddy Kane and you perform the rap music and years later, the doorbell rings and who's at your front door? What was that moment like? Yeah, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Big Daddy Kane. He had a song called Smooth Operator and I performed it in our, in our middle school talent show with my best friend, uh, Buzz, and um, they all knew that I love Big Daddy Kane. I used to want to dress like him. In fact, my, 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 my sister, Shireen, her boyfriend had this MCM outfit and it was the same outfit that Big Daddy Kane wore. And I begged him for that outfit. And he, it was way big. I couldn't even wear it, but he gave it to me. And I wore it at the talent show. Um, and yeah, and I just, I was a real big fan of Big Daddy Kane. And not too long ago, um, he showed up at my house. And I met him for the first time. And, and I, re I recited some of his rhymes from back in the day for him. And it was just a mat. It was an amazing moment to know that, you know, someone else that I looked up to so much, you know, that I had a chance to meet him in person and share some, some moments with him. Why is How Deep Is Your Love your favorite song? For, for, for those people who don't know, I'm talking about the Bee Gees song, How Deep Is Your Love, which is a tremendous song. I love that. I, when I read that about you, I was surprised to hear that, given everyone you've, you've worked with. So my question is, and I, I should do a better job rephrasing that. You've worked with the most famous musicians in the world. And I'm curious why the Bee Gees, who I absolutely love, Saturday Night Fever, one of the best soundtracks of all time. Why is that song your favorite song? I just think it's, it's just a well put, it's a well put together song from, from the beginning to end, melodically, the way it's structured, the chord progressions that I play all the time, those chords. Um, 
it's it's just the way the harmonies are are crafted in the song. It's just it's it's probably one of the most easy listening songs I've ever heard in my life. Like, and it's a song that you know you can never get tired of. I've I've listened to the song for thirty plus years now, and I and I'm still not tired of it. Um, in fact, I go to it often when there's a certain mood that I'm trying to be in creatively. Um, if I'm trying to be in some of a more of a mellow, smooth creation mood, I'll go and listen to that song. Um, it's just one of the greatest songs. It is. It really is for me. For me, and there's a lot of great songs. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of great songs that I love, but for me, that's my favorite song to listen to. My favorite. I want to talk about <clears throat> money for a second. We talked about it at the beginning. You made a lot of money. At a very young age, I mean, to have a $1.8 million deal when you're 17 years old is insane. Uh, you're not seeing athletes. I mean, today you're seeing athletes doing that, but but I mean, you're in the 1% of 1% of 1%ers. I know you've made a lot of money throughout the years, and I also know a lot of wannabe musicians, they want to be famous, and of course, there's a flip side of being famous, right? You can't go to the grocery store anymore, so that's a whole other thing, but a lot of people are very motivated by money. So in the music, and, and I know a lot of people in the music business, you know way more than me, but people spend a lot of money in the music business. A lot of people are very flashy. Uh, they're drawn by the money. They're addicted to the money. They spend a lot of money. Where should money rate as a factor in terms of what we're doing in our life and our careers? I don't think you ever should ever chase money. I think, I think, I think you know, the hip hop culture specifically has made money too much of a an idol and has made it where has made it where if you're not flashy then you didn't make it right i never forget i'll tell you a little quick story i never forget riding an elevator with diddy with p diddy one time back when he was puffy and he was trying to sign me and i was 18 years old and he he asked me what kind of car that i have now mind you i'm 18 years old i have a lexus gs300 that's a pretty good car, I would think, right? It's a nice car, right? He says to me, well, you're not doing it unless you have a Benz. He had put in my mindset that unless you have a Benz or a Bentley, then you're not even successful. And I think, you know, it's sad that the hip hop culture makes you feel that um, unless you are flashy and have all these certain amount of diamonds and certain amount of expensive cars with um, things that you put on the cars that don't, aren't worth a dime once right after you take it off the lot. If you put all these extra extra things on your car, you're losing, you're, you're losing the value of the actual car that you took off the lot. But they don't teach you that. I think it's sad. Um, I think, you know, more importantly, more important than the, than the money, it sh- you should be building your brand. Because if you build your brand correctly, the money will come. The money will the money will come. You don't have to chase it. If you make great material and and your music is great or whatever craft you're in doesn't have to be music. If whatever you do is great, the money will come. The money will chase you. But get away from me, money. Get away from me. <laughs> it's, it will literally chase you because if you're great in your craft. I really believe that if you're great at what you do, then 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 the, then the money and other things will come. Before we finish today, I want to go ahead and ask some more open-ended questions. I call this part of my podcast, fill in the blank to excellence. Are you ready to play? Sure. The biggest lesson I've learned in my life is? Trust God always. My number one professional goal is? To own a... Uh, the number one publishing company. My number one personal goal is to make it to heaven. My biggest regret is not marrying my wife when I first met her. I waited four years too late. I love that answer. The one thing I've dreamed of doing for a long time but haven't done is make a movie. But you're going to make a movie, right? Yes, soon, very soon. If you could go back in time, the one piece of advice I'd give my 21-year-old self is? Don't stop believing in you. If you could meet one person in the world, who would it be? My eight-year-old son, Royal. 
He's the coolest. Yeah. If you could work with one artist who you have not worked with before, who would it be? Adele. The one question you wish I had asked you is? What are you currently working on? What are you currently working on? I have the number one album out with SZA for 10 weeks straight now. Congrats. What's coming after SZA? I'm working on my own documentary. I can't say it's coming right after SZA because I'm still working on it. So I think it's going to be a, at least a year, year out. Is this going to be a documentary about your life? Yes. Yes. That's, that's going to be awesome. Rodney, I want to thank you for taking the time today for being a guest on In Search of Excellence. I've been a huge fan for a long time. I was super stoked when Miguel thank Solano, you. shout out to him, said, hey, you want to have Rodney Jerkins on your show? And I said, oh, I'd love to have Rodney on my show. You're a legend. I love your music. I heard you're an amazing person, which you are. And I want to thank you deeply for being a guest. Thank you, Randall. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. <laughs>